you're looking for the the quick fix the easy ticket the the you know the easy way out or or the fast fix you know it it's not that and that's not my experience that's not what i've seen with most people it is step by step. There are lots of switchbacks that are super annoying. <laughs> like I thought I already covered this territory. <laughs> I'm gonna go way over here and then back again. So it is it is a step by step process, and um, you might have moments where your container expands more, but I can pretty much guarantee you it's gonna be followed by an, an uncomfortable contraction. I've had. I've done so much work. Right? I, I have read so many books. I've I've had so much body work. I've had so many tunings, um, and I am still having experiences of greater expansion and um, and discovering more potential. Right. So so this is not a one and done thing. This is a journey of illumination and expansion. This is a lifestyle. I'm so honored to introduce you my guest for today's show. It's Aileen Makusik, and she is famous for her work in, in sound, in uh, body energetics, and all kinds of interesting stuff. And I've been fascinated by sound healing for many years. So for me, it's such a joy to welcome you here and introduce you to my audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alana. Great to be here. Hi, everybody. <laughs> right. Um, the show is called Awakening Now, and it's all about awakening. What is awakening? What happens before, during, after? What is the whole thing? So I would like to know your definition of awakening. How would you describe what that is? Mm. Wow. That's a really great uh, question and something useful to think about. And I think that there are different stages of awakening. I think that awakening is something we awaken to one level, um, but then we can keep on awakening to deeper, wider, brighter, more illuminated, more embodied, more empowered um, levels of awareness. So I think that it's something that goes on and on. I don't, I don't see it as something that happens once because your body can only hold so much light at a time. Most of us are kind of, our electrical system is wired into our wounds and, and the tension around those wounds, people who've had a lot of trauma. And the more trauma you have, the more sort of armored and frozen and stuck you become. And you don't have the wiring to support like a radiant awakened state. And so this is something that really has to happen in degrees. And one of the things that I've observed that people really struggle with is they have an experience of themselves as more expanded, better for themselves. But almost inevitably, after we have an experience that awakens us, we go through a period of contraction. And people will very often resist this contraction and think that they should be different. They'll beat themselves up. Their inner critic will start going. They'll resist the experience of the contraction. And then they'll just get kind of stuck in it. Uh, but if you understand that life that expands through expanding and, and opening up those circuits, and then when you bring in more light and more energy, it tends to push out the gunk that was in you. I just got off the phone with a very good friend of mine who went through a very powerful week of healing. She had a lot of tuning. And when it was over, um, she got sick. And mm -hmm. uh, But that was really like love and light and energy and expansion coming into her system and then pushing out the stagnation, the mucus, the trash, basically, that isn't awakened, you know, just the old mm -hmm. junk. Um, and then, and then, you know, then you go back into another expansion. And so it's really a, a, a practice. It's a, it's an ever going expanding thing. And I think the really key part of the whole journey of awakening is to not resist those contractive periods. Oh, you explain <laughs> it so well. Yes. <laughs> um, would you like to share a little bit about your, your awakening when, when you got interested in that or how it happened or what happened after the initial recognition or whatever it happened just a little bit of 
story? Yeah, well, <laughs> mine was drug induced. <laughs> so I did uh, LSD when I was 18 at this very amazing place, uh, this uh, a cabin that was built with the remnants of Hearst Castle on the shores of a lake called Clear Lake in Northern California. And I had this incredibly um, expansive awakening. Uh, I had a very visceral experience of unity consciousness. I uh, felt very powerful. I felt like a healer. I, there was there was one moment where uh, some little kids were playing next door and one of them got hit in the head with a Frisbee <laughs> and, and she started crying and I could see very clearly that it was all an illusion and that she wasn't really in pain. And I went over to her and somehow communicated that and she stopped crying immediately. <laughs> I was like, well, that was interesting. So, so I felt like I had an experience of taking the express elevator up to the, the highest point, the most expanded potential that I had. Uh, and I was like, wow, I'm enlightened <laughs> and I'm going to be enlightened for the rest of my life. And the next day I contracted to like the size of a pinhead. I, I got so small and I realized that I was a pretty messed up 18 year old American girl. I was bulimic. I had a lot of trauma in childhood. Um, I was, I, I was, I was not well mentally, emotionally, or physically, but that drug gave me a, a doorway into my soul's potential. And, and really that experience of that expanded place really became my inner North star. And I realized that if I wanted to get back to that place on the mountain, I was going to have to go step by step through all the switchbacks and all of the scrambling and all of the, the, the healing and holing that needed to happen in my pain body in order for my light body to hold that kind of expansion. Wow, oh, 18. How did you, how did you decide to do this? I mean, what? it just, it just happened. I just ended up in a circumstance where I got invited to do it. And I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> I'm pretty adventuresome. And I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm open for things. I'm mm -hmm. one of those people who will jump in with both feet and say yes uh, to, to the <laughs> opportunities that life has put in front of me. Wonderful. Well, for me, it was magic mushrooms, though. So. Yeah, well, and I had a similar experience on mushrooms like six months prior, where, you know, where I definitely there was a, an awakening that happened there, but not to the degree that happened six months later on mm -hmm. LSD. But I mean, I think for many people, mushrooms are that doorway into that expanded state of consciousness. And I think most importantly, an experience of unity consciousness and a, a deep understanding and seeing and knowing that life is all one and that it's all interconnected and that it all arises from the same soup and goes back into the same soup, right? That the, the underlying fabric of unity that is life, that our educational system, which puts us very much in our left brain, and we're talking about molecules and units of matter. And so we are all indoctrinated into an educational system and a paradigm of separation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is divide and conquer, divide people within themselves, divide people against each other, divide people from God, divide people from nature, divide people from um, an awareness of their own unified self. And so that is, it's very written into the programming of the matrix. And I think awakening is is breaking out of that and seeing uh, um, the gestalt, the wholeness and the interconnectivity and the illumination because the illuminated nature of life is also hidden from us. Most of us were taught about solid, liquid and gas, but we weren't taught about plasma and ether, the, the illuminated states, the connective states. And, and we don't learn about our body's electrical system. That's what my research has been. You know, actually I had another experience before the mushrooms on weed <laughs> where I decided to see how much weed I could actually smoke and what would happen. Cause I'm very much a scientist, right? So I'm always curious about if I do this, what will happen? And so I went off into the woods, I rolled a bunch of joints and I went off in the woods and I just smoked as much as I could. And I was lying on the, the next to a pond and all of a sudden I had this experience of my own inner illuminated nature, my own electrical system, my own light. I was just suddenly like out of my head and into my electrical plasma body. And because I didn't have any 
scientific framework to hang that on because we don't learn about our illuminated biology. Mm -hmm. uh, the only framework that I had to put it on was wondering if I was Jesus Christ. <laughs> because, because I'm like, I am the light. <laughs> and, and I was like, am I Jesus Christ? What? And it's so easy to see why people who think they're Jesus Christ have this illuminated awakening. That's the only framework they have to hang it on. And then people call them crazy. But all they're doing is waking up to the, you know, the sun that is out there and the stars are, are in them. You know, the lightning, the lightning bugs, the same, it's all the same electricity. It's all one electricity. It's all one electrical liveness. And, uh, and so when I discovered that the body had an electrical system, it really resolved that duality for me of, you know, it's spiritual or it's scientific. I'm like, actually, yeah, this helps both <laughs> worlds. And, and I would call our electrical system, our, our mind, our conscious mind, our subconscious mind, where our memories are, it animates your being, right? It, that it's your essential aliveness. And when you die, your light goes out. When we talk about a soul being illuminated, uh, coming back for lifetimes, and when you die, your light goes out, I would even say that your electrical system, your bio field is your soul. So it oh. unifies everything. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. I love that you have this scientific mind and you can explain that for skeptical people. <laughs> like um, yeah. <laughs> recently I was speaking to this uh, woman. She does transmissions, you know, she, energy transmission. She calls it divine, line tra divine light transmissions. And for some people it's like, this is woo-woo, that is not real. What What kind of gullible people go for that but when you think about this is antenna it's always transmitting there is the electrical charge there's a magnetic thing going on everything is interconnected and yeah i would like you to ask you to talk a little bit about resonance because i see that it's the resonance that plays a huge part in how we share our electricity our light <laughs> yeah absolutely well, everything in you is is moving or vibrating <laughs> and anything that's moving or vibrating creates waves and waves propagate. So mm -hmm. we're all giving off vibes all the time. I mean, there's nothing woo woo about the fact that everything in your body is beating or moving or, you know what I mean? And, and it's doing it with electric charge. And this is a place where we kind of miss the forest for the trees because most people will go be like, yeah, my brain waves are electric. Yeah, yeah, my heartbeat is electric. Yeah, I know that blood carries a charge. Oh, bones are crystals that make energy when, when they compress. Well, that makes sense because dancing and running gives you energy, right? So, so okay, well, well, all this points to the fact that we have electric current running through us. We have electric current running through us. And anything that has electric current running through it has a magnetic field around it. That's our aura. That's our biofield. That's our energy field. It's a magnetic field that surrounds electric current. This is all science we already understand. You know, we learned about magnetic fields around electric currents in grade school. And so it's just really no different, right? <laughs> and, and so everything is, is a traveling wave within your body, your digestive wave, your heart wave, your brain waves, everything is sort of waving through you. And, and it's waving at particular rhythms and particular speeds at particular uh, places where it's harmonious and other places where you're off key or jammed up. <clears throat> and if people are running thoughts of, of bad intention, we can sense that, right? Because we, we all have vibe meters and we, we can sense into just like nature, you know, the, the, the deer suddenly feels that the lion is looking at it. Uh, we're no different than that. And so everything that we think, that we feel, all of our experiences are encoded into our electrical system and they're vibrating. And so when we meet someone, who has had similar experiences, has similar vibes, we resonate, we actually amplify each other. And that is like magnetic attraction because now we're jiggling like in <laughs> resonance. And that's We've been amplified, right? Why some people really like charge us up and turn us on and, and other people like drain us out or make us angry. <laughs> and it's all happening at the level of these subtle interactions of vibrations that are going back and forth between our electrical systems. Mm. And it works at a distance too, right? So, so in the, the quantum model, which I don't use, um, whenever we have a coincidence or like we sense someone at a distance, or it's even used to explain uh, 
distance healing is quantum entanglement. And I don't find that to be a useful model because what's really going on is, is more of like we were talking about, about being an antenna and broadcasting certain frequencies that we pick up. Like everybody's had the experience of having a, a feeling of a loved one and, and you just sense them, you sense their incoming energy. And then a moment or two later, you, you know, they message you. <laughs> right that's resonance in the ether that's resonance is that mm -hmm. i'm tuned into you and your vibe even though we're separated it, you know in in space and i can feel you you know part of the what people love about falling in love is that they can feel their partner you know they can feel the resonance of their hearts because you are antenna is broadcasting on that wavelength and so just like you know a radio station tuned to a particular dial you pick up that wavelength. And so that, you know, I do my work with tune forks at a distance because of resonance, because I can tune my signal to that person's signal and I can tune into it and I can work with it and, and adjust it. Mm, that's, that's where it gets really interesting because you mentioned the tuning forks. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you tell, can you tell me and everyone about your work with the tuning forks how I, how it works how it works yeah, yeah i'll tell you how it works <clears throat> well it works again with science that we already understand i mean it, it's very simple a tuning fork is simply a tone generator it produces a steady coherent tone and what i sort of stumbled into was this discovery that I could actually bounce sound off the body, activate a tuning fork, direct sound at the body, and listen to the pingback. To actually use it like sonar to bounce off the electrical system, the, the vibrational waves that the body was giving off, and actually read the pingback. Just like <laughs> ultrasound shows us a baby, you know, or bats or uh, echolocate to find you know, to, to visualize what's there. Um, I've discovered uh, that I could hear the sounds coming off the body with the tuning forks. And not only could I hear them and find places where the body was off rhythm or jammed up or um, stuck in some way, but I could actually use the tuning fork to uh, to modulate what was going on in the body. I basically discovered that our bodies are self-tuning instruments yeah. and that when they perceive themselves with like, so the tuning force is like a mirror in that it will kind of reflect in this sonar kind of way, what is going on with the body. So, you know, well, why doesn't the body just fix itself? Well, it's sort of like, if you haven't looked in a mirror in a long time and you get to a mirror and your hair is a mess and you have a poppy seed in your teeth, like, What's the first thing you do? <laughs> Obviously. You go groom yourself, right? Yeah, you just, you put yourself in order. <laughs> you put yourself in order. And so when the body has this reflection of itself out of order, it now has the opportunity to see and sense that out of orderness. So, and then the tuning fork is acting like a metronome. It, it's producing a steady rhythm, right? And everything in the body is rhythmic. So, the body uses that reflection of its own dissonance, the, the steady rhythm of the tuning fork to actually like relax and bring itself into tune, to bring itself into order. Wow. And so I developed a practice of just finding areas in the signal that were wonky, staying there until the body sorted itself out and then sort of moving along to the next spot. And that, that is essentially the practice of biofield tuning. We're sort of technicians that you sound like sonar to find areas in the electrical system where there's noise or resistance in the signal, which usually correlates to some pattern of tension and or pain or dysfunction in the physiology. And so the, the field is like the blueprint of the body. So if the field is filled with noise and resistance, then the body is going to be doing the same thing. But if the body has the opportunity to bring that noise into order and relax, then the body releases that tension and brings itself back into a relaxed, neutral state. So we use this to treat pain. We can treat acute pain um, very quickly and readily. Uh, we use it to treat anxiety. Anxiety is a rhythm. 
the body's just stuck in this particular rhythm, doesn't know what to do with its energy. So we provide it with a reflection, with rhythm, with breath, with grounding, and then the body resets itself. And then it's like, oh, I'm suddenly not anxious anymore. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, it, it happens very quickly. You know, mm -hmm. we, we, uh, we actually have a published study on uh, a, a feasibility study we did a few years ago where we had 15 volunteers of the 13 that completed uh, everybody came in with clinical anxiety. Every single person came in with clinical mm -hmm. anxiety. They received three biofield tuning sessions over Zoom, one hour a week for three weeks. And when they came out the other side, none of them had clinical anxiety anymore. Wow. And, and we got this published. Uh, we wrote a mm -hmm. quantitative paper that shows all the graphs with all the markers going down. And we got a, a, um, a qualitative paper of people's experiences, like what it, what they went through over these three weeks as their electrical system began to self-regulate better because of these sonic inputs. And so now we're in the middle of a three-year fully funded study with 100 volunteers. 65 are receiving five biofield tuning sessions. Mm -hmm. And then the rest are just doing their regular thing. <laughs> and, uh, and so we'll, we'll be able to see the effect on a much larger group of people across a greater duration. And we'll probably see the same thing that we've seen. You know, I've been doing this for 28 years. I've been seeing this in clinical practice over and over and over again. And we actually have thousands of practitioners and students around the world who also are having the same kinds of outcomes with the people that they're working with. So this is really moving from a chemistry based lens to an electrical based lens from a mechanical sort of um, solid sort of world to a vibrational patterned kind of, and this is really this movement in the age of Aquarius, you know, which is symbolized <laughs> by waves. So it's still science. It's just physics based science, resonance mm -hmm. and entrainment, a strong coherent signal will overtake and entrain a weak incoherent signal. Um, electrical currents have magnetic fields. Magnetic fields actually guide and inform electric currents. So when we make adjustments in the magnetic field, it's actually changing the way that electricity is running through the body. Fascinating. Uh, um, I went to your biofield store once and I downloaded some uh, recordings just to experience them. And my experience was I listened to, I don't remember exactly which one, but as soon as I finished, I started to get like sick, bad fever. My body was trembling. I was like, oh, I have no energy. I have to lay down. That's how I knew that it was working. I was like, wow, this is powerful stuff. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't think that like listening to a recording of tuning forks could actually move things around in you. But, you know, we know that music moves us, right? I mean, you would, you, if you listen to a song that was powerful, that was moving, it might make you cry. It might, if, if you were in grief, it might even make you weep, right? Mm -hmm. So sound moves us and we know that. And so I'm using that principle of how sound moves us just with a single instrument in a very intentional way. And so it, it moves us, it, it rearranges our energy field. And you know what you just talked about, what, what I used to call a detox response, but I now call a cleaning response. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I changed it is because I, my observation that generally when people are introduced to this work, uh, they, they tend to have one or the other or both either an internalized cleaning response where now their body has more energy running through it. It has, it has more flow. It has more centropy. And so it takes out the trash and you, you might go into like cleaning mode where it, like when your oven goes into deep cleaning mode, right? It gets hotter. You can't use it like an oven. It's busy cleaning. And then it comes out shiny when you're done. And so this is the same in our body where we might have a flu-like response. We might produce mucus. We might have what I call interesting bathroom experiences. Uh, we might have waves of emotion come out. You know, all the things that our culture teaches us to suppress, suppress your mucus, suppress your cough, suppress your emotions. And so everybody's all gummed up with all this stuff that they've been taught to suppress. And when we get sound and energy and more electricity moving through the body, those things that are we're holding in resistance in our signal start to let go. And it can be messy. And, and it's where a lot of people, when they have a cleaning response, 
response, get scared, think that it's wrong or bad, you know, don't want to do that. They're like, I did this because it was supposed to make me feel better. And it made me, blah. <laughs> like, that's exactly what it's supposed to do. Better out than in. And it, it's really kind of shifting up our mindset around what healing really looks like. Healing looks like your body taking out the trash. That's what it looks like. When we have a fast metabolism, it means that all of those systems of like cell regeneration and getting rid of the dead things and that that's all like moving that's health right no algae in your inner fish tank and and everything in a state of flow not in stagnation or resistance or inflammation or like some trapped emotion that explodes out sometimes <laughs> so but if people don't have like that kind of inner response, they very often take their extra, now they have more energy and more order, and they apply that to their environment. They suddenly have the energy to bust that pocket of clutter or to clean out that cabinet or uh, to, to, to start a creative project or finish a creative project, right? So, so that is like the externalized cleaning response or the internalized cleaning response. And either way, it's a good thing. I, I would say it can be called awakening, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. It it definitely is. And and the way we often say awakenings don't come without some kind of pain, some kind of discomfort. I, I think again, we've been really trained as a culture to avoid discomfort, to seek comfort, mm -hmm. and I, and healing, true healing, and true awakening to our own potential. Um, does involve discomfort. And I've been through a lot of discomfort in my own journey. But now I'm 55 years old. I'm totally healthy. Like I don't have any pain. I don't have anything wrong with me. My digestion is great. I sleep great. I have, I have plenty. My needs are met. You know what I mean? Like I, my metabolism, my, my energy body, my physical body, are are clean <laughs> and because of that like i don't get jet lag i can eat anything uh, now this has taken years because i was such a suppressor and such a i was addicted to sugar i tried quitting sugar when i was 18 and it took until i was 44 to finally succeed because i was so addicted to the way that i used it to avoid my feelings Mm. And all of those feelings that I stuffed down with sugar were stored in my body. And it, like, you can't bypass feelings. Like you have to feel it to heal it. You just do. Like I, I'm like shortcut Shirley. Like if there's a fast and easy way to get anything done, like I will find it. I, I'm very um, attentive to like, what's the easiest, most efficient way to do anything. And, and I've looked for a way around, you've got to feel it to heal it. And I haven't found it. <laughs> I, I think the, the way out is through, and it means going back through all of the, those discomforts in some way. Now, I'm not saying you need to sit around talking about them. Because biofield tuning actually gives us a way to bypass the story. And we can just mm -hmm. get right into where that wound or habit or whatever or trauma response is stored in your signal and, and get the body to reprogram it without having to talk about it. But it, in that process of going there, like it might be really uncomfortable. Like I make big guys who haven't cried in, in a decade cry. Like... <laughs> because, and we don't even have to be talking about whatever it is that I've, un, you know, uncovered in their field that's making them cry. But, but, you know, when it's all said and done, there's this huge relief and release. Was it comfortable to cry and in front of a woman that you don't even really know? No. <laughs> but, but did you feel so much better on the other side? Did you take all of that energy that was frozen there and then like return it back into flow? Like, this is how we achieve our literal electric potential by mm -hmm. by finding all the emotional baggage that is sequestering our life force and digesting it and integrating it. Like we can't get rid of anything. You know, sometimes people are like, oh, I'm going to get rid of this. And, you know, what you resist per persists. What you're trying to get rid of is going to keep coming back at you. You have to digest and transform and alchemize 
Mm -hmm. the energy of that experience through forgiveness, through, through awareness, through uh, commanding, um, through tuning. I mean, tuning helps a lot, <laughs> but there are other ways to do it as well. And, and then, and then you expand. So we're not raising vibration. We're not trying to have high vibes. You know, we need the whole full spectrum of vibration. We are infinite and we contain infinite vibrations and vibrations that have higher frequencies are not superior to vibrations that have lower frequencies. Even if you look at it in like a brainwave state, you need those delta waves to sleep, right? Bands would be no good without percussion and bass, in my opinion. <laughs> like, true. <laughs> right? Like, like the, the whole high vibe thing, I always make it, it makes me wonder how the, it makes those bass players feel. <laughs> like <laughs> that bass. So oh. that's like a false, a false language because it doesn't even speak to what really happens in an awakening is that we are, we come into harmony. Our vibe harmonizes, it clarifies. We find our vibrational sweet spot, like hitting a ball in the center of a tennis racket. Like we're just in that sweet center. And, and, and then our consciousness actually expands. It expands in every direction. It goes up, yes. It goes out, it goes down. We become more grounded. We become, this is the sort of paradox of this, is that as you become lighter and lighter and expand more and more into your the potential of your electrical system, you actually become more and more grounded and more and more rooted at the same time. Mm. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also fascinating that you could map trapped energies in the biofield. And you you could just say, okay, these emotions or this old stuff, remaining old stuff is in this place in the body pretty much um, universally. That's very interesting for me. Like a lot of people have problems with the stomach. So if, if we talk about these energies, what could you say that is trapped in the stomach? Hmm. Well, energy gets trapped in the physiology, but it also gets trapped in the field. Uh -huh. And we end up running charge in imbalanced places within our field. So the, the magnetic bubble that is your electrical system expands about six feet on either side, about two feet above and below. And, and we are an energy bubble. And in this model, the body is inside the mind instead of the other way around. So wherever we go out of balance in our mind, then we that's where the electricity goes. From where, where your attention goes, energy flows. And so, for example, if someone has a lot of suppressed anger, if they often feel anger, but they suppress it, or they have anger at themselves, this inner critic that's sort of always judging them and being angry, then what you're doing is you're pulling the life force, the electrical juice that powers you over onto the right side of your body. Because when we feel angry, this is the part that gets stirred up. This is where anger fires is, is over the liver and then off to the side of the liver. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of people end up with like liver issues be, because yeah, they might not be eating clean, but they also have energetic inflammation in the liver from unexpressed or undealt with anger. And that creates a kind of uh, stagnation as well. And it pulls energy away from the stomach. <laughs> and also what also pulls energy away from the stomach is when people are running on adrenaline. So if you are under continual stress and pressure and haven't figured out how to get out of that and into a state of regulation, then you are never in rest and digest. You are always in fight or flight. So that is uh, pulling energy from your bones. It's, it's pulling energy from your adrenals. It, it's not sending energy to your digestive tract for you to have robust digestion, which is essentially electrical fermentation. Hmm. And it's like, it's like the fire there is too low because the fire is off in all of these other places doing other things. 
So, so anger is one of the feelings that can pull in energy away. Powerlessness mm -hmm. is another mm -hmm. one. So the, the, the solar plexus, the, the yang or masculine or right sided imbalance is hot. It's fiery. It's anger. Uh, the imbalance on the left side is wet. It's inward. It's powerlessness. It's stagnation. And so a lot of people go back and forth between the two. <laughs> So you asked me about um, how I mapped the biofield. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the way I, I mapped the biofield was I certainly didn't set out to map the biofield. I didn't even know there was a biofield to be mapped. Like I, <laughs> I was, it was this whole process of discovery was very much like fumbling in the dark with moments of illumination where I would suddenly see a pattern it was it's kind of like i was teaching myself sonic braille and i learned to recognize particular sounds because like if you and i are listening to a sad song i don't need to tell you that it's sad because you just know and it was the same way with the tuning forks when they would get into particular areas they would just sound a particular way in the same way that music mm -hmm. sounds a particular way so uh, sadness actually has many different expressions. It can be deep grief that wants to wail. It can be a sort of melancholy. Um, it can be uh, lonely. You know, <laughs> there, there are many different ways that sadness can sound. And I noticed that whenever the fork was sounding sad, I was off the left shoulder, hmm. um, right? So uh, anger can sound different ways. We can have different kinds of anger. We can have volcanic anger. We can have seething anger. We can have bitter anger. And those all have particular qualities. And I was finding those off the right solar plexus. Um, fear, you know, the sort of classic music soundtrack for fear is the Jaws soundtrack, right? Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and when we're afraid, our energy actually does this. And when someone is afraid, you can hear that pulsing of fear in their signal through the forks. So it was just really, uh, you know, exposed to many people over many hours, over many years, where it all kind of came together into um, this complete picture of the anatomy and the physiology of the tonal landscape of the atmosphere around our bodies. It's like this whole world kind of hidden in plain view that I was able to map with sonar. Yeah, like e echolocation, like dolphins. Exactly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and is this easy to learn when you teach? Let's say, can you teach this to other people? This hearing? Well, I taught my very first class uh, back in 2010. So I was working on a master's in education degree. And I didn't want to put myself out in the world as a teacher until I had accreditation. And so, mm -hmm. um, but I had a group of friends and clients who really wanted to learn. And they pretty much bullied me <laughs> into uh, teaching them. And I was telling one of my brothers about how I was going to teach this class. And he said, can other people do what you do? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. And, uh, and sure enough, they could. They were able to comb through the field, find where the resistance and noise was, stay there, tell when it released, move on to the next. I mean, everybody was able to find everything, feel it like I felt it, um, and use the map. So I was very reluctant to share the map with my first group of students. I was like, from a scientist's perspective, this is one person's subjective experience. And, and I, it hasn't been cross-checked. It hasn't been verified. Like, I don't know if I even just made all this up, right? And so I feel a little weird about teaching it. But then they were able to use the map. So the map is, is sort of striated or compartmentalized with each um, sort of zone, or maybe kind of related to the chakras or nerve plexuses, uh, having a particular flavor of thought and feeling and that, that gets recorded there or that gets experienced there. Like for example, the right shoulder, if there's anybody watching that's had right shoulder issues, mm -hmm. um, when we are in the habit of being a caretaker, a caregiver, a, a, um, a person who's always looking out for the needs of others or putting other people's needs ahead of our own, right? Saying yes when we mean no. 
uh, we tend to end up creating an imbalance of energy and then end up with right shoulder pain or issues or injuries. And I have a girlfriend who, uh, single mom, owned a massage therapy school, was a massage therapist, was also an adjunct professor at a few different colleges. Her whole life was like overextended in that way. And she called me one day and she said, Eileen, I was out hiking and I fell. Guess where I injured myself? And I said, your right shoulder. And she said, yep, that's where I injured myself. So, so injuries don't are not, for the most part, happenstance or accidents. They tend to happen in the places where we are mentally and emotionally out of balance. And when a lot of people have pretty big injuries, it's often at a time in their life where they're under stress and their life really isn't working. And it sort of comes in as the, the spiritual two by four um, to, to whack them back into, you gotta figure out how to balance yourself here because this isn't working. You, you know, you're not in your body, you're not um, in, in integrity with mm -hmm. yourself. Right. And so, uh, so this, this map, uh, okay. So in addition to being stride, it's also timelined. So the timeline part is, is interesting because as we generate information is everything in our body is making these waves, right? And it's all happening in your electrical system. You're like a little EKG readout. <laughs> like, this is how, I'm, this is how I'm feeling. This is how I'm feeling. Right? And, and so as those waves, they grow away from us like hair and uh -huh. form these standing waves within the field that um, so anything that is we experienced recently, and this is our memories, this is our memory bank right here that is close to us. Anything um, that when we were young is away from us. So the that outer boundary holds the information of gestation when we were kind of inside a boundary and then just inside of that is birth. And then with a tuning fork, it's like dropping a needle on an album and reading the vibrational record, the vibrational output of a person's life. So if I'm working on somebody who's 60, I'm going to find information that was generated when they were 30, about three feet away from them. And if I find it off the right side of the solar plexus around 30 years old, uh, and there's a lot of dissonance there, I'm going to say, hmm, did something go on with your dad when you were 30? Because this area also relates to our relationship with our dad. Or was there something that happened when you were around 30 that you got really angry about? And they will always say, Yes, you know, that actually I got really angry at my dad. <laughs> like, so, so, you know, I, I just saw this over and over and over again. And then my students could use the map. They could find a wonky spot in the field, plot it on the map. You know, they didn't need to have spent all this time figuring it out like I did. And then they just say, okay, in the biofield anatomy map, this spot I hit um, is around 10 years old and may relate to something that was really sad, you know, and, and it's really stuck and it's not moving. And it and so is this something that uh, you recall or does it make you think of anything? Because a, a lot of our work we can do without identifying what the memory is. We can get things to shift and move and resolve, but there are some things that I found in the field that don't won't budge until the person actually communicates about it, until the, uh -huh. the story is witnessed. Right. And we're not counselors, we're not therapists, we're not doing anything other than just listening to the story. And in that telling of the story, the tension that was held in it is able to release because it has been witnessed, it has been resonated with, it's been seen, it's been validated in a way. And, and in that triangulation of being the witness, we help people to digest and integrate these experiences that they couldn't by themselves, especially at that time. Fascinating. I have so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I ask everyone, what is your best advice for somebody who is looking to awaken? To awaken to, you know, people are looking for enlightenment, awakening, normally mm -hmm. to get out of their situation, running away from where they are, who they are. Yeah. But they think that this awakening is going to give them this special ticket out <laughs> to the Paradise Islands where everything yeah, is for them know, beautiful. Yeah, that, that's a lie. <laughs> I, I, and I think people, stories like Eckhart Tolle, um, 
in a way are useful, but in a lot of ways are not useful. Because the dude's like, I was just sitting on a bench and I achieved enlightenment and then I stayed enlightened. I'm like, who the heck does that happen to? Who does that happen to most of us? It, it's sort of like thinking you're going to achieve wealth by buying a lottery ticket. You, you're looking for the, the quick fix, the easy ticket, the, the, you know, the easy way out or, or the fast fix. You know, it, it's not that. And that's not my experience. That's not what I've seen with most people. It is step by step. There are lots of switchbacks that are super annoying. <laughs> You're like, I thought I already covered this territory. <laughs> I'm going to go way over here and then back again. It is, it is a step by step process. And um, you might have moments where your container expands more, but I can pretty much guarantee you it's going to be followed by an, an uncomfortable contraction. I've had I've done so much work. Right? I, I have read so many books. I've, I've had so much body work. I've had so many tunings. Um, and I'm still having experiences of greater expansion and, um, and discovering more potential, right? So, so this is not a one and done thing. This is a journey of illumination and expansion. This is a lifestyle. This is, uh, you're not going to do the quantum leap from here to there and avoid the pain and avoid the dues that you have to pay and avoid the tears that you have to shed and avoid the shame that you have to confront and avoid the boundaries that you need to make, right? It, your light is inside of you. You don't have to go out anywhere and get it because you're already light. You are already enlightened. You are already awakened on a particular level. But there's noise in the signal. There's muck in the stalls. There's stuff in the way of that being your daily experience. And you have to muck the stalls. <laughs> you do. And it's not glamorous and it's uncomfortable. But the way that you get to that, it's like, it's like knowing that there's a beautiful spring somewhere, but it's all been used as a trash heap. And, and you've got to like literally remove all of the trash and, and clean it all up in order and, and maybe dig a little bit for that spring to come up. Well, once that spring comes up and that light comes out in you, you're like, whoa, there it is, right? So cleaning and, and here's the thing is that most of the junk on your spring isn't even your fault. It's ancestral, it's cultural, it's the, the false edifices of colonialism and how that's hijacked our light and taken it away from us and sold it back to us. We've been told so many lies, there's heaps of lies there in the way, right? I call us, the, the generation that are here now, your audience, you and me, we're the karmic cleanup crew. We're here to do the heavy lifting, to, to roll up our sleeves and, and deal with this stuff so that the generations that come after us don't have to do that, that they can stay with that light and that knowing and that we can pass that on to them. We can pass that torch of illumination that we worked so hard to get to because so much was in the way for us, right? So if you're part of the karmic cleanup crew, Roll up your sleeves and dig in for the long haul because that's what it's about right now. And it's worth it. Like it is, there's nothing else I would rather do. And, and as you go, you keep finding these Easter eggs. You find these treasures that were some part of you that you left behind and, and then you uncovered or some hidden talent that you didn't even know you had. And life comes along and unlocks it for you. So there's, there's all of these treasures to be found in this sorting of trash that, um, that absolutely make the game worth playing. You know, and listening to you, it kind of, I realized that what we call faith or destiny, or, you know, life brings this experience on that experience. It's literally just in this energetic bubble, in this electrical system that, when it's time to come through and pop or be revealed, it just gets here. It's nothing outside of that making this happen. It's like our own, you know, rolling up the sleeves moment <laughs> that yeah, is coming exactly. from and nobody, this book. nobody is going to save you. Like there's no person or teacher or or pill. <laughs> like <laughs> it, it has to come from you. 
you have to be the impetus. You have to be the give. You, it, you are your own hero. You are your own savior. So stop looking for somebody outside of you. Like you are the light that you are seeking. It's in here. And it's brilliant and it's beautiful and it's in everyone and it, it it is amazing and everyone is amazing and brilliant and beautiful we've just been raised in an environment that did this to us so this is the game is like how do i restore my light <laughs> and you can <laughs> and what's about the superheroes can superheroes come and save somebody else like without them knowing well yes <laughs> and no Right, because when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So, <laughs> uh, you know, like I, I recently took on an apprentice because I realized that he was uh, kind of like me in that, like we activate people's inner superhero. So I, I don't save you. <laughs> What I do is I awaken the energies inside of you to help you remember that you're powerful and can save yourself like and, and superheroes work together you know we need mm -hmm. each other um but but that light that same superhero light is in is in all of us right some of us have just battled our way to find it ahead of others and <laughs> uh, maybe have more experience with it but i'm not rescuing anybody when i help them to turn on their light right that that i'm i'm just passing a torch i'm i'm you know using my candle to light their candle they've got the candle for me to light right yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that makes so much sense <laughs> well it's so great to have you here and i love your laughter i think that's the energy waves that are coming out of you and it's gorgeous Mm, thank, you. thank you. Well, you know, that that is our nature is playful. Uh, the nature of our light is that it's playful. And, um, and, and, and again, everybody has that. And the more you lighten up, <laughs> the more <laughs> playful you become, you know, even though life has its heavy moments, I mean, I'm certainly not immune to the tragedy that is unfolding in the world, right? And sometimes people can get really stuck in that. But there's a whole other piece here. You know, life is, is a tragedy and a comedy. And, uh, and it's really important that we hold both poles. Um, and and understand that this is the experience the contrast of life that we can be light and we can also be sad because of the world and we don't have to be one or the other you know we can move between those as as life arranges itself and do you have any final words something you like your core message or something you want people to know like really I think that this awakening, right, this is really about what I said about the unity consciousness, but I would also use the word God. And the reason why I use the word God, now, I'm not affiliated with any kind of church or I don't label myself as a human. Um, I went, I was raised in an atheist home. I was educated in an atheist uh, educational system. I became interested in new age and started using the word source and universe uh, i found that to me god had become um, a word that was co-opted by religions that were framed in falsehoods and i didn't want to use the word mm -hmm. but as a sound therapist and as a person who works not only with tune forks but also with voice the word god is very resonant in our body it, and it feels good to say the word God. And to me, God resonates my whole being and also into the totality, like the one light, like what is God? God, God is the one light, is, is the whole, is the undivided. And we get our light from the whole, <laughs> right? We, we are a cell in, in the whole universe, so all of creation, all of that, which has was not created has yet to be created is created like the, everything throughout time and and space it's all one organism and healing and health and good spirits and good fortune even come from our resonant relationship 
with God and God is love. <laughs> the, the life is love. Like the, the fundamental template of this matrix is unified and loving. And it's only our own noise and false programming and lies that get in the way of that. But ultimately to me, awakening is about uniting with the beautiful, resonant, shimmering love of the one. And that's where all healing really comes from. Yeah. Wow, that's powerful. Yes. Yeah. Um, and the last thing is how people can find you or reach you or do you work with people one-on-one -on -one or you have your team? How does that work? Somebody wants to contact I, you? I don't really uh, do one-on-one -on -one anymore. I, I did for many years, uh, but then I ended up really becoming more of a teacher. And now I'm actually a CEO. I have an organization. I have a shipping department. I have, so that, that's how my, my trajectory has morphed. And um, I know I really, I work on friends and family here and there, but, um, but we do have thousands of people all over the world. We have hundreds of people listed on our website. The work can be done at a distance. We have a biofield tuning clinic, uh, which you can also find where we have just practitioners who work under the biofield tuning umbrella in an online booking system that you can try. Uh, Biofieldtuning.com is a website and I have a YouTube channel uh, with quite a lot of, of interviews and uh, instructional things and uh, free tunings. I did a series called Sonic Sundays. It's sort of an ongoing series that are conversations. Like my first one that I did is about what is God and what does God mean to me? And, mm -hmm. uh, and what is Christ consciousness? So it's all, I uh, try to be as neutral as possible when talking about difficult subjects. So there's like a whole, initially I called them Sonic Sunday sermons, but um, so those are accessible and there's a lot of information and then each one has an actual tuning in it. So that's oh, something wow. to check out. As well. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for your gifts. Much appreciated. Yeah. It's such a yeah, pleasure to pleasure. be with you. Nice. You too. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you everyone for listening. Until next time. Bye for now. <laughs>